you you became fascinated by memoirs at a very young age. I, uh, I, I was so, that's what it is with me. It's not that I'm good, particularly good at it. I just love, I always loved that single voice kind of crying out in the wilderness of, of life experience. I started reading them when I was a little girl. I, I, I only have one notebook from my childhood and in it when I was 10, so it's 1965, I wrote, um, when I gr grow up, I will write one half poetry and one half memoir. And then after that, I wrote, I'm not very successful as a little girl. <laughs> When I grow up, I will probably be a mess because that's what like all the neighbor ladies said. You know, we had a dangerous house. I mean, people were not allowed in our yard. You know, people would run through all the yards coming home after school and they'd get to our yard and they would go out in the street and go around it because uh, they weren't allowed in our yard. Cause it because was, you were the scary people? We were the scary people. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, we were. What, what, what do you, but what was it about the one voice crying in the wilderness that, that really kind of entranced you? And, do, and what were some of the earliest memoirs you remember? Oh, the, t the two that I remember, well, I, there, I can think of three or four, actually. I remember, uh, my sister and I talked about this, and, and um, I remember Helen Keller. Remember Helen Keller's oh, uh, book? Yes, yes, of course. Um, uh, and, uh, and I remember an excerpt in a bridge version of Lincoln's apologies. There's a big noise in my apartment. Let's Don't worry. Okay. Um, uh, and then when I was in about the 10th grade, I think, or 11th grade, Maya Angelou came out with, I know why the cage bird sings. And it was such a, her voice, I think you know, she had worked as a poet and um, there was something about language being someone speaking. I, I'm, I really, I, I, when I read my Angelo, who was a, a black girl, uh, as she would have said, in the Jim Crow South, I was white girl in the Jim Crow South. And um, who was scorned and beleaguered. We were both sexually assaulted as children. I didn't think, I mean, for me, literature was kind of the stuff of, of white guys, of guys who wore like tasseled loafers and used summer as a verb. And um, my mother who had lived in New York and was a painter had, um, was a kind of Marxist weirdo painter who married my daddy who was an oil worker, Texas oil worker. And, um, I, you know, I, she got the New Yorker used from the people at the grocery store who, who subscribed to it. And so this was real literature to me. I mean, these were beautiful, singular voices. Angelo doesn't, doesn't sound like anyone else. Richard Wright, a lot of those, mother was involved in the early civil rights movement. I know you can hear that ambulance. That's okay, though. I mean, I think okay. it's part of life, and we okay. pick up these sounds. And I, I was wondering, is that New York, or is that where you are? Are you in Syracuse? No, I live in the city. Oh, you live in the city? I live on the Upper East Side, yeah. So do I. No, we have to walk around the park. Definitely. I know you know Diane Sawyer's right over here, too. I do. I yeah, do. Yeah, Diane I Sawyer's like two blocks from me. I know. I don't see her very often. We're, I... going, for, we're going for a walk tomorrow. Oh, you are? Just name tell drop Miss I... Diane. Please tell her I said hi. God, but she is so... Oh, look. Now I can hear the siren. Yep. They're at your house. <laughs> they're at your house now. Isn't that Diane funny? Diane is so nice. I, 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 you know, she was so in love with Mike Nichols and I, I well, wonder, who wasn't? Yeah. But I wonder how, how she's doing now and, and how she's getting along. I think she's doing great. I Good. do. I mean, I don't see her a lot, but we live close to each other and we occasionally see each other. And I think she's great. I think she's, she's so elegant. Isn't she? Isn't she just the most elegant creature? I mean, to have grown up in Kentucky, yeah, and it's come that out like hair that. And those pretty lips. Oh and my she was, god! Yeah, and the, she kind of glows. 
I she wrote did. about her in my memoir about how, like, just bedazzled I was by her because she was sort of, she's everything I'm not. You're America's sweetheart, Katie. Everybody wants to be you. Are you kidding? No, no, no. Okay, Mary, we don't need to get into this. But we anyway. do. You're America's <laughs> sweetheart. No. no. No, and what does that mean? I mean, we could really dissect that term, but let's not do that is now. There, is there something in it unseemly that I'm missing? I don't think it's unseemly. I think there's something obviously incredibly gendered and probably yeah of course so if it's gendered it's got to be bad <laughs> well not necessarily but it's sort of like perky right you know perky Perky means i i've been called perky too and it means really? you're short it means you're short i think it means you're vapid oh shit oh <laughs> you oh. can say shit on our podcast <laughs> oh shit i thought it meant <laughs> I thought the worst it could mean was that I was short. Now I understand they mean now, I was How napping. tall are you, by the way, Mary? I'm 5'5". Five five. I'm not that short. You're not that short. And I'm I average. Would not, I wouldn't call you perky. I uh, would no, I'm call a glum, you... I am a glum bitch. <laughs> no, I would call you scrappy. Uh, Same thing. Scrappy also means short. I don't think scrappy is perky, though. Perky is, like, cute and, like... There's something childlike about it, perky. It's sort of, it's almost toxic optimism. Right. That's but I right. think it, that's scrappy right. is like, you know, you don't give up. It's, 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 I wanted to name my book Moxie because my dad used to say that I had Moxie. You certainly do. I think but that's right. I, I really love that word. And I also love how uh, symmetrical it is. But I got the kibosh from my publishers. What's your book's title? Uh, it's kind of a sort of point. It's fine. And Adriana, who's helped me write it, is probably listening uh, and saying, don't say anything bad. It's called Going There. I oh, could I think not that's think. that's great. I guess. I mean, it's sort of a double entendre because I've gone a lot of places and I really go there when I'm being honest about myself. And right. people I know. But um, I think that's a great title. Do not whinge. Okay, I will Do not win. Stand proud. That's a great title. Okay, I will. I'm going to have to kind of work on that, Mary, because it just doesn't speak to me in the way that Moxie did, because that really I reminded think go, going me of my there dad. Is, going there is better. Also, are you Jewish? No. Uh, well, actually, my mom was Jewish, and so... Ergo, am, you are, in yeah, a way. I am a member of the tribe. I was raised a Presbyterian, but I talk about finding out, discovering that... Uh, that I'm half Jewish, which really, according to Hebrew law, means Jewish. Uh, when I saw a menorah in my uncle's bookcase, and I was like, <gasps> "Well, yeah, it's so funny." I I made the mistake of wading into the posting something, and I got called an anti-Semite on um, social media last week. And well, I'm that like, is a very, very tricky, complex topic to wade into. It really yeah, is. Yeah, it really is. But, I mean, I just, I, you know, I'm a New York intellectual. I mean, everybody I know is Jewish. My daughter-in-law is Jewish. My granddaughter is Jewish. You know, I'm... Um, but you're Catholic. I'm Catholic. Yeah, I converted from... I was an agnostic. and Which so, is yeah. so fascinating. I know. Who could... Who would choose that who wasn't born to it? That's... How that's it's really Talk something. to us about, and then we'll get back to memoirs, but how did that happen? Well, my third memoir, Lit, sort of goes into it, and for eleven ninety nine, everybody listening to this can know all about it. Um, well, I had a hard time. It's Lit. I had a hard time quitting drinking. Kel Priest, you know, who <laughs> <laughs> no one's going to be surprised, given how I grew up, that I had a hard time quitting drinking. Imagine my surprise. It was the one thing... Uh, uh-oh. It was the one thing I was not going to be. Uh, An alcoholic? Was, uh, was a drunk, yeah. I was the little girl, like, dumping the vodka bottle down the sink, saying, you know, I hate this. And, and you know, the terrible thing about alcohol, I was just in that Hemingway doc documentary that Kim Burns did. Right. I've been watching that as well. And the, the terrible thing about it for a writer is that Early on, it works. It's a great drug, you know. It's, How so? Um, I mean, it, it it liberates you. It what? I think I think um, you know. First off, I grew up the way I grew up, and I have a very, I have a big 
startle reflex. <laughs> you know, I'm oh my god, I'm uh, what they call capital N nervous in the South. Uh, not to the extent my mother was. Um, uh, thanks to you know codependent English teachers and you know various therapists, but. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a depressant drug in it, and it sort can sort of level you out until you develop a dependence on it, and which, and, you know, it took me a long time to figure out that once you cross that line, you can't go back to when it worked, mm -hmm. but but you remember when it worked, and you keep trying, it's like, it's like having a bad boyfriend who beats the crap out of you, but you remember how much fun he was, like at the, like that first year or so. Selective memory, yeah, exactly. yeah. Exactly. And and so how how has Catholicism well, replaced I, alcohol? Well, I I um I couldn't get sober. I could not get so I couldn't quit drinking. And I'm a pretty disciplined person, you know. Um uh, in general, I mean I kind of had to be. I was a single mom. I was, you know, you I didn't have come from a lot of means. I, you know, I ha always had a lot of jobs. I, you know, and I was extremely self-sufficient, um, but I, and I, I finally started praying. Somebody just said I had to pray morning and night on my knees. So I started praying l literally the way, you know, it was almost like a dance move. I would get on my knees and say, keep me sober. And I would get, I didn't believe in God at all. Um, but I stayed sober doing this and something started to happen to me. I started having an experience like in my body and all I could say is it was just like my anxiety level went way down. But they think now if you if you go into recovery, you go into a 12 step program. This is kind of an interesting fact is that when you tell your story and you know this from what you do for a living and you listen to other people's stories, you um, you secrete oxytocin, which is that kind of feel-good hormone right. that lowers cortisol and adrenaline, and, and it calms you down. But more than that, you feel connected to people. You feel attached to people in a kind of tribal way. Um, and that is comforting. And so I just told myself I was... I didn't say there was a God. I just told myself, I was a lifelong atheist from a family of atheists, that there was no, that I was hypnotizing myself. I think that was it. I thought, well, I'm doing these prayers. And I was sort of praying more and more, like throughout the day, I began to pray. But then when my son was about six, he came into the bedroom one Sunday morning and said, uh, I want to go to church. And I was like, why? Like, why? And he said the only sentence that could have gotten me to get up and take him to church, which was, I want to see if God's there. And I was just like, well, you know, I didn't like soccer either. So we started this thing we called god Rama, where <laughs> um, anybody we knew had any kind of spiritual practice, anything, any weirdo. I went to a Jewish midrash. I went to... Baptist Church, Presbyterian, Episcopalian. Oh, wait, and you took your son to all of these things? Yeah, we went to Zendos and temples, and yeah, we did every, we did it all. We did God Rama. And I found myself, Tobias Wolf, the great memoirist Tobias Wolf, um, invited me to this little Catholic church in Syracuse, New York, and there was an amazing priest there, just kind of, he wasn't a saint but he was a very holy person. And he was kind of the only person who could have gotten me to convert. He was very, uh, not what you would expect. He was just a little Irish parish priest. He wasn't a, an intellectual, he wasn't a firebrand, he wasn't a super lefty. Um, but he, he did things like the local gay and lesbian community when they asked they got kicked out by the Methodist, if you can believe it. And um, they came and knocked on the rectory door and asked Father Joe, um, can we use your, can we rent your church basement? And he said, oh, it's just there, you know, you can just use it. And next thing you know, we're having gay and lesbian masses. And and uh, 
I remember when he was dying, I asked him, what, what made you do that despite, you know, some of the very uh, anti-LGBTQ plus everything uh, rhetoric of, of our church and the hierarchy, um, if not the, I think of the church as the people. So um, he said, well, they asked me. And I said, so I'll say what my parents, you know, if they told you to jump off a bridge, would you jump off? He said, I just assume whoever knocked on my door, Jesus had sent there. And I thought, so he was just a very simple person, very humble. And he didn't have a lot of fancy ideas. Well, at one point I did, before I even got baptized, I no, I think I had just gotten baptized. Anyway, I kept saying, I'm not going to get baptized. There's so many things I hate about the church. They don't let women be priests and blah, blah, blah. And um, we had a fight about it. And I said, um, you know, I, I called him before I was supposed to get baptized. I said, I'm not getting baptized, you know. They should open communion. They should let women be priests. And he's like, I'm sure the Holy Father prays about that a lot. And it's sort of like you would run at him and you would just land on the other side of him. You know, like he wouldn't argue with you. Um, and I said, no, I don't, I don't think the Pope is the ultimate religious authority. He said, well, maybe you will someday. <laughs> like he was just like, and now we have Pope Francis, and I kind of do think he might be. <laughs> so, so when was this? When was this, Mary? This was, in the, this was in the 90s. So I was over 40. Um, and, and what about your son? Yeah, my son converted, and he was also he got confirmed in high school, which he later told me um, he only did for me because I was so devout, I had become so devout. Um, and he he's married to his wife is Jewish, his wife whom I love like a daughter. Like if he hadn't have married her, I would have killed him. Um, <laughs> uh, but he lets me drag him to you know Easter and Christmas, and you know. Let's me drag him to mass and 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 after you started praying, was that was that the end of of alcohol for you? I haven't had a drink since. I mean, I get a lot of help. It's a one day at a time thing, um, and uh, as you know, and I I could not have done it by myself. I can say that I could not have done it by myself, and I hated everything about it. I just hated, and and when I started, you know sitting in church basements and saying to people, I had this great, I had a couple of great people I met in my life, a woman I called Joan the Bone and Lit, who was just hilarious. And um, she was going to fire me if I didn't start praying. She wouldn't talk to me before, anymore if I didn't start praying. She was sort of keeping me sober, I thought. And so I started praying. Uh, it's funny, I could have just lied to her that I was praying. Um, but I'm still very involved with uh, trying to stay sober and trying to help other women, especially young women with, with children. I think it's really hard, uh, whether you're married or not, uh, to have small children and be fighting addiction. You know, I think people really uh, struggle. Do you think we have a better understanding? I'm getting a little off course because I want to talk to you about your process and, and writing because you, I, you have so much to say about it, but you know, I'm just curious if you think that people have have been willing to talk about addiction more openly. Um, you know, you heard a lot about women and and uh, during the pandemic, sort of self medicating with alcohol, and it's still in many ways in the shadows. I think, but I I. I think it's such a huge problem. I remember on my talk show, there was like this mom's group and they'd all get together for wine. And there was something about that that really upset me. And I'm sure I sounded kind of like a a bit of a, what's the kind of person who's a always- prude. Wet? yeah, like a, the village prude, but also, yeah. The scold, like a scold. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But, you know, I it just upset me the idea of like their kids running around and they're all drinking wine, you know, that's around the kitchen island. Did. Huh? Yeah, that's what our parents did. And 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 I just feel like um a lot of people are really struggling with this, but it's still f full of shame and 
uh, you know, where other forms of, of addiction, I think, are being acknowledged and talked about and dealt with, I still think alcohol is still in, in many ways hidden. Am I wrong it's all, about that? It's all hidden. I mean, I look, here's the thing. I think, I think it's something like, you know, 5% of the population drinks like 50 or 60% of the alcohol that's consumed. If you have this ailment, as I do, I was somebody who was a occasional drinker, a binge drinker, and it's progressive. If you have this ailment, you're a drunk or a drug addict, even smoking marijuana, whatever, everybody says it's natural. I always say, well, strychnine is natural. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of stuff. Going to the bathroom in your pants is technically natural. Um, but there's a lot of stuff that isn't healthy. It doesn't matter whether it's natural or not. So um, if you have this thing, uh, you literally cannot stop. You can't stop. I could not. I'm somebody who... You know, I exercise, I do Pilates, I floss my teeth, I eat a lot of vegetables. <laughs> you know, I'm technically a really healthy person. I couldn't stop, could not stop drinking. Um, and uh, I had always been able to stop before. So I, I just think there's a line we cross. And I think, um, I think writing about that, uh, for me, I'm writing about faith. To be an intellectual and write about faith, I mean... People just, I remember uh, Richard Ford sending me, uh, the novelist, you know, sending me a postcard saying, when I got baptized, saying, Carr, not you on the Pope's team, say it ain't so. And I'm like, you know, this is somebody I knew when I was in graduate school who's like, people openly mocked me and, and accused me of supporting pedophilia. I mean, people say terrible things to you when you're Catholic. They used to have no problem <laughs> saying incredibly insulting things. Um, how do you handle that? I just say, oh, well, you know, what are you going to do? Um, you know, the wonderful thing about having my hard drinking outlaw mother, who, by the way, got sober when she was about 60 and stayed sober until she died. Um, so that's a legacy from her, uh, as well as my love of books. Um, but, um, Look, they crucified Jesus. I mean, he was the guy walking around saying, let's be nice to each other and, like, take care of poor people and heal the sick. And everybody's like, oh, I've got a great idea. Let's crucify him. I mean, not a, I'm not for everybody. That's the way I put it. I'm just not everybody's cup of tea. And so some people aren't going to like that I'm Catholic, and I'm like, oh, that's, that's fine with me. Here's the thing about me and Catholicism, or, and I believe any spiritual practice. It worked for me. I'm somebody who was, I tried to kill myself as a little girl. I was so depressed out of my gourd. As a child, I tried to kill myself. I was so miserable my whole life and uh, became an alcoholic and a drug addict and had just lots of adventures <laughs> you know, in my young life. Yeah, I ran away from home with a bunch of surfers, which I write about in Cherry, uh, you know, had, you know, surfboard scooped out and filled with drugs and and uh i take great comfort in in my prayer life but i also take comfort in all the you know uh, you know horse hockey around the church i go to mass i go to confession i i um long time ago i volunteered at a soup kitchen downtown it was one of the great experiences in my life um I take great comfort uh, in the church, and um, there are a million things about the church I would I don't like. There are a million things about being an American I don't like. There are a million things about being a New Yorker I don't like. But you know, I think I'm very. I noticed something when I went into the church. Here's what happened: was I noticed when I went into the church. I wound up going to this little church in Syracuse after Father Joe retired where the, the Berrigans, uh, Jerry Berrigan, Jerry and Carol Berrigan used to go. And he was 85, 90 years old, still chaining himself to nuclear reactors and going to prison. And the people I met who were taking in orphans from El Salvador and volunteering and taking care of people's, you know, AIDS babies and 
adopting kids and doing all this loving stuff all talked about Jesus all the time. They're like, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And I was like, what a drip. Even after I converted, I just thought, my friend Nick Flynn has a wonderful poem where he talks about a guy opening his chest, you know, saying, look what I did for you, <laughs> opening his shirt and saying, look what I did for you. It was kind of my idea of hell. Um, but from going to church and talking to some of these people in prayer and having some spiritual guidance, I've I've uh, become one of those crazy people who's, uh, I'm, work, I'm writing partly, this book is mostly, that I'm working on now is mostly about getting older. Part of it is about Jesus. Um, I, as I like to say, Christ is a job title. Um, but when somebody's, if you, you know, you're, you see those guys standing on your porch with the pamphlets, you know, and the, with the Jesus is all Swedish looking, kind of looking on, you know, you think, oh God, not those guys. You know, or the guy with Jesus tattooed on his bicep in the subway, you think, not him. Um, or somebody, you know, uh, but I became one of those crazy Jesus people, so. How was writing a, a kind of different, was writing a different kind of religion for you, Mary? It was, I mean, the, I always say, you know, poetry saved my life, that poetry was like my first altar and poets were my first saints, you know. Even when I was a little girl, I memorized poetry, those those little Winnie the Pooh poems, you know. Or Christopher Robin. Christopher, wherever they go. James there's always James poo. Morrison there's Morrison. All... Yeah, exactly. Weatherby George Dupree took That's great right. care of his mother, though he was only, he was only three. three. Oh, I love that James, you know James Morrison Morrison, mother, he said, said he, no, mu like, you must never go ta down to the end of the town without consulting oh. me. Uh, unless you go down with me. Oh, unless you go down with me. I think there's also a consulting in one of those, but who no, knows? No, maybe you're right. Maybe you're right. I'm <laughs> such an, a school marm. Forgive me. I can't stop myself. That's okay. That's okay. Just I'm going go. to go. Of course, I'm going to Google that poem when we're done, but Good. and I'll write you and say, Mary, you were right or I was right. But so you were, you love poetry. My mom loved poetry too. Um, and, 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 and how did that then move into just writing because well, I, as you said when you were little i'm going to be a poet and i'm going to write memoir autobiography and, yeah. yeah um i think um i think because poetry was so much about feeling and economy and form and shape and also my drunk mother when she was hung over i would memorize poems and i would memorize i started very young memorizing shakespeare like really young and um, not the poems, not the sonnets, but the big speeches. I like the speeches better than the sonnets. Do you remember <laughs> any of them? Oh, sure. Yeah. Gosh. Um, yeah. Comfort no man speak. Let's talk of graves, of worms and epitaphs. Make dust our paper and with rainy eyes write sorrow on the bosom of the earth. Let's choose executors and talk of wills. And yet not so, for what can I bequeath, save my deposed body to the ground? My life, my lands, and all are bowling brokes, and nothing can we call our own but death, and that poor model of the barren earth to serve as paste and, co and cover for our bones. Isn't that good? No, I can do Ju Julius Caesar, Hamlet, Macbeth. Uh, Richard the second, Richard the the, uh, the Richard the second speech that was Richard the third, Romeo and Juliet, as you like it. Um, wow. And uh, when I recited the poems, I got cra I mean, I got she liked that. She liked that I liked poetry. That was she was your mom that. was a bit quite quite erudite, wasn't she? She was a very smart uh, lady, and the horrible thing about her. I, I tell people this all the time. She was insanely competent. I mean, she was a journalist for a while. She was worked the police beat in the local paper, which then uh, even going out at night in a car, they called her a whore, you know, for um, much less having a job, but going out at night in a car without a man to accompany you. Oh my Lord, what could happen? Um, uh, and she did not give one rat's ass what anybody thought. Um, yeah, she could sew, she could lay bricks, she could crochet, she could tat lace, she could um, 
she took the washing machine apart and fixed it. I mean, she was just smart and uh, had wonderful think, literary taste. Yeah. Do you, yeah, it sounds like it. Do you think society's limitations uh, on her, placed on her, completely fucked her up? Or would she have been fucked up all by herself? I think there's a bunch of other stuff. There's a bunch of other But do you stuff. think it played a role? Because I think about my mom. Oh, yeah, who, of course. You know, um, and I think about all the moms out there who grew up in a certain time where, you know, the expectation of what they could do and be was so limited. I mean, just like now, I mean, with I, I have, you know, so many young men of color, students of color, you know, and they used to tell me. 15 years ago about being stopped by the police and detained and, you know, searched. And one of my favorite students, wonderful kid, still lives up in Harlem, uh, used to carry in his backpack what he called his nerd uh, signal. I said, what do, what do you mean? He said, I carry a Rubik's Cube and a journal. Um, and he's a great big kid and, and uh, very athletic. And... Uh, you know, not to be allowed to be angry. That's like a lot of black men wear glasses. Exactly. When they don't need, when they don't exactly. need them. Exactly. Uh, and not to be allowed, and my mother was, my mother was pissed off for a lot of other reasons. Um, and, uh, yeah, no, I think the way, Look, I think young women are just so damn cool. I mean, I think, you know, long maybe 20 years ago, somebody was interviewed from Ms. Magazine was interviewing me and saying, don't you think these women, young women, you know, walking around in their booty shorts, you know, with their, um, you know, that they don't understand the struggle the way I said, look, this is about, free. first off, you know, they don't, don't make the sacrifices that we made. I said, first off, I was looking out for me. I didn't care about any other woman, to be quite honest. I'd like to say I did. I went to marches and stuff. But, um, you know, I'm not some, I didn't sacrifice my life for the movement. I needed a damn job to make a living. And I couldn't get one because I was a girl. <laughs> you know? So, you know, these women, you know, this is supposed to be about freedom for us, for, for all of us, right? Isn't that what it's supposed to be? But I think these young women are so cool, and they teach my students. They teach me so much. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I don't know how we got off on that. Well, I was asking you about your mom and sort of if 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 that might have contributed. But it sounds like there were a lot of things that. But certainly that uh, you know it makes you crazy. I think it. I think it does. It makes you crazy. I think I was sexually assaulted by the guy who ran my MFA program. I mean, like he wouldn't let me out of his office. And um, he was at Princeton at the time. And um, uh, and when I went, sort of finally got out of there, which was it was a, it was a degrade. Even though he never touched me, but it was one of the most degrading experiences. The things he said to me were so degrading. It just, it was horrible. And um, when I went back and told the women uh, I admired, these great writers, Louise Glick and, you know, Heather McHugh, these wonderful uh, poets uh, I looked up to, they said, oh, you know, he, he's just in love with you. And I'm like, no, you guys, you don't understand. This was really scary. What happened? Like, I'm not a candy ass. You know, I'm like on the, you know, I am a candy ass, but I'm not, it's not like we haven't had to get by a, a, a fella or two in our, uh, you know, but this was really menacing and degrading and scary. And these young women just, you know, they have such courage and they speak up and out. And, um, they show me how to do it, I think. You said writing your first memoir was like knocking yourself out with your fist. And I you think also it, writing any memoir is knocking yourself out with your own fist, yes. And, and you also said writing uh, a memoir is, or writing memoir, which is it, writing memoir or writing a memoir? 
Writing a memoir. Okay. Yeah. It's like wading deep into memory's waters and drowning a little bit. Everybody drowns. I mean, I'm in this book now. I've been working on this book for two years. Um, and it's about getting older. And, it's about getting older. It's and called, Jesus. And, and Jesus. It's called Just You Wait. Um, just You Wait. Because here's the difference in me and Nora Ephron. I don't feel bad about my neck. <laughs> You know, like in fairness, I mean, I just, I decided when I was about 40, instead of worrying about how I look now and thinking of how I looked before I was going to, I always think about how I'm going to look when I'm 80 or 90. And I'm going to look back at me now and think, you were hot, girl. <laughs> That's what my husband says whenever I complain. He says, you're never going to be any younger. But think for, if you think forward. Yeah. You'll look because don't you look at yourself when you were like 40 or 50 and think, dang, I, what was I worried about? I look great. I know. But I, the worst I ever thought I looked, I think I was 14. <laughs> I mean, you know what I mean? There is something good about getting older. And I think, but I think writing memoir, I've done three of these. This is my fourth. I've written a book about this. I've been teaching this since 1985. I've been teaching memoir at a university level. And you would think I would know how to do this, wouldn't you, Katie? I would. I don't know how to do this. How it's come? Because, here's why. Because it's sort of like if, if somebody says to me, I want to write a memoir, it's like saying, I want to have sex or I want to have, I want a makeover. How should I look? Well, I don't know. How do you want to look? Like what's your, you know, it's, you have to find a voice even though I have a voice as a writer that sort of translates from book to book, I don't have a voice for being the age for being 60. You know, I wrote in the voice of, you know, an eight-year-old girl. I wrote in the voice of a 15-year-old girl. I wrote in the voice of, you know, a 35-year-old drunk. I don't have a voice for being 50 or 60. I don't have that voice. Um, and, uh, I think we all remember in sound bites in these convenient little clips, as you know, from having just been through this and you tell yourself things. And then when, and I always kind of interview myself, I'm like, really, you think so-and-so like, like I remembered when I was writing Cherry, I thought I was smart when I was in high school. I did. I thought if you had asked me, I would say I was one of the smart kids. I was not particularly smart, Katie. Like <laughs> I really wasn't. I mean, the bar in my hometown was pretty low. You know, I knew the alphabet past the letter J, you know, like, <laughs> like, but I was not a smart kid. I was a fan of smart kids. My best friend was the smartest girl in school. And the guy I dated was like the smartest guy in school. But me, not so smart, not that smart. No real evidence I was smart. So I think, um, we have ideas about ourselves in these sound bites that are convenient, but those aren't true. Those aren't really how you live experience in those ideas. You live in liminal time in your body and you have to kind of reoccupy a former self, kind of and zip yourself into your old body and lower yourself into that other place and time if you're really going to tell the truth about what's going on instead of just kind of reciting your resume or something, you know? That's hard too. And I know you, you, you write a lot about that in the art of memoir about memory and truth and, 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 you know, how much, how much liberty do you have? And, and memory is, is a tricky thing, isn't it, Mary? I mean, oh, yeah. I don't remember. I don't know what city I'm in about when I wake up in the morning. But, like, but how do you how do you deal with that? Because you do, you do see things through a very distinctive point of view, and and can you fill in the blanks, or how much how much truth has to be told, and how do you find the truth uh, in in all There's the blurry only, moments? Only one way. There's only one way. If you start to make stuff up and, as you say, fill in the blanks, 
a wall comes down between the truth and you. It's sort of like, I, the best example I can give of it, when I was writing Liars Club, I knew that I was going to change, other than my immediate family, who I notified in advance, I was going to change people's names, you know, like the mayor and the fire chief and the, you know, different people. And I let, I asked people, I said, pick your name. What name do you want to have? I'll give you that name. So when I was writing it initially, I tried to use people's fake names and I couldn't do it. Like I would be writing John and I'd be like, but your name's not John, it's Bob. <laughs> you know, like it's just not the right, it's not right what's going on and um, you cut yourself off from what's true if something's blurry and you think the reader wants to know about it tell them it's blurry you know may, say maybe it went this way maybe it went that way I don't know I think if you show your process and show yourself show your good faith you know, when I tried to write fiction, I think a real fiction writer tells the truth in fiction better than they would a memoir. But a real memoirist, somebody like me, when I try to write fiction, I do such great things. The character who's me is so noble and wise and kind all the time. Um, and that's just not how I roll, it turns out. I need a lot of Jesus. I need a lot of help, a lot of prayer and meditation, a lot of leafy greens. And at the end of the, of the Art of Memoir, you have a five-page must-read memoir reference list. Um, tell me how you came up with that list, and, and, and can you tell me how certain books changed your life and oh, yeah. really impacted your writing and your career? Well, I think any book... Um... Maxine Hong Kingston, Woman Warrior, you know, it's just such a singular voice. And I'm so, I'm so naive in a way. I always believed, I always believe every memoirist. I always say I'm like the guy who thinks the girls in the strip club really like him. You know, like you could probably lie to me and I, I would, when I'm reading a memoir and I, I would believe it. Um, but no, like at one point, um, in that memoir which uses you know chinese mythology and you know sort of ancient storytelling techniques she got from her mother and um family and uh this image of a woman warrior of somebody who's fighting for freedom or really to keep from being murdered um she's like leaping on clouds and she's like ninjing through the air and you're like wait a minute you know, like, but uh, a book like that, the voice of it was so singular, and it and it has such uh, a dramatic story to tell, and yet I felt like I was in the experience. It's somebody who grew up very differently than how I did, or Richard Wright's, I always say Richard Wright's black boy, um, renamed American Hunger, is is like in some ways it was the first bestseller by an african-american other than frederick Douglass, you know who was just like a regular person he wasn't you know a fan he wasn't frederick Douglass. you know he wasn't booker t washington you know he was this kind of regular guy and his occupying that child's body and occupying that child's place in america at that point i think it came out in 1945 I think I think all those early memoir uh, mid-century memoirs from the last uh, century um, really influenced me. Um, that one, Richard Wright, that Maya Angelou memoir, um, uh, Nabokov, Speak Memory, it's just one of the great Stop Time uh, by Frank Conroy, you know. Um, uh, Toby Wolf's This Boy's Life, uh, Mary McCarthy, Memories of Catholic Girlhood. I mean, just great. Michael Hare uh, Dispatches is, I think, the greatest book about war, even though it's about genocide uh, in some ways. Um, but it's about how, 
you can go to war as a reporter and decide that you're morally responsible not just for what you do but for what you see that other people do um so yeah i mean the great thing about each one of those books is so singular you know i you're talking about the level of truth i don't i'm not representing the truth of history i try to rep I try to show the reader how my mind works and how my memory works and how I'm trying to piece it together. So they know that this is a piece together thing. This isn't a research piece of journalism or history. It's, it's the truth of memory which blurs all over the place. But the minute you start to lie, it like the, there's a door that slams down. Um, writing Cherry, in some ways, I. I, I chose that title, because I've been sexually assaulted when I was a little girl, I chose that title in a way, ironically, because I thought I never was innocent. I never got a chance. I grew up in this alcoholic household in this violent, a place that turned out to be a really violent place where I grew up. Um, not, you know, Rwanda during the genocide, but... Um, I was a hypersensitive kid in this place and with these hard drinking people in the house. And um, I, I, my mind just went blank. I have no, no idea. No, you were talking about Cherry and why you named it oh, Cherry. Yeah, that I, th it was an ironic title. And then when I started um, actually occupying that little girl self, and where you're writing a boy's name on your notebook like over and over like an idiot. Um, and there was a boy I had such a crush on, Bob Perry, all honor to his name. Um, <laughs> watching him, you know, the way a damn entomologist watches a spider. He's out there dribbling a basketball. I'm just staring at him, slack jawed. Um, I was innocent. No one could take that away from me. I wasn't thinking, oh, come boff me into guacamole. <laughs> you know, I was thinking, and I remember when I was writing the book saying to my editor, I just feel like I can't write this. She said, what do you mean? I said, what I wanted was for him to like skate up to me at the skating rink with like one red rose and like ask me on the couple skate. Like that's what I wanted. That was my big, you know, fantasy. And she said, well, you've got to write that so that it, it's as alive, you're as alive in that moment, and that's as thrilling. You know, at one point we played a kissing game, it was July 4th, and in my garage with a bunch of kids, and he kissed me, and it was so shocking that he kissed me on my mouth. I just couldn't believe it. And I remember at one point I put my, I put my hands up on his shirt, and he had this, like you know how there are polo shirts? Yeah. Well, where we grew up, they didn't even have polo shirts. We, he had a seahorse on his shirt. And I remembered the outline of that seahorse. And so I sent him the pages before I published the book. I said, am, am I remembering this right? Or, you know, and he called me on the phone. He said, you are such a witch. I said, what do you mean? He said, how did you remember that shirt? <laughs> he said, as soon as you remembered that shirt, I was like, oh my God. How does she remember this? <clears throat> I was like, you know, I was 13 years old and you were the cutest boy in school. Like how it was the, it was the highlight of my life up until that moment, you know. But no one stole my innocence. My innocence was there, you know. They can't take it from you, you know, even when bad things happen to you. And so... I think I thought it was going to be this like dark kind of raunchy, sexy, later, not at the 13, but later sexy. And it wasn't. It was a much more innocent book. And yet very, for me, writing it, those memories were very vivid and, and powerful and erotic, um, but not in the way, but in a child's way, not in some porno fashion or something. So Because you transformed and you occupy once yourself I got at into, a certain age. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's Just right. like you're now writing as 
someone who's 66, but looks well, damn Well, I'm great. writing as somebody who's 50, actually. I've got to... Oh, 50? Yeah, I got to live faster. Yeah. <laughs>